Hello again. The BBC Master, like many of the 128K computers that came out in the mid-80s, was an attempt by the manufacturer, in this case Acorn, to provide an upgrade of their ageing 8-bit machine, in this case the BBC Micro. And this was um, to eke a bit more life out of the platform while they could work on their next generation computer, where I believe they dabbled with making a 32-bit processor. The result for us was we got what is arguably the ultimate BBC computer, which not only had extra memory but also had some extra features and um, had some changes to try and address some shortcomings on the original machine. Another thing they did was pack in a bunch of software that people would often buy separately. There was a word processor, a spreadsheet, filing systems to support both floppy and hard disks, a text editor and a serial terminal program. And, like a lot of software on the BBC, these were supplied as sideways ROMs, so they needed a lot of space for those. The original Model B had five ROM sockets, 16K each. The leftmost one had to contain the Acorn MOS operating system. The other four were for sideways ROMs, one of which was almost certainly basic, supplied with the machine, although you could swap it out if you really wanted to. Any serious user would also want a disk filing system, leaving two sockets free. If you wanted more, you'd have to install a ROM board, like the Integra B that I have and covered in an earlier video. When making the master though, Acorn could take advantage of the new, larger ROM chips and combine the operating system and seven sideways ROMs into a single 128 kilobyte mega ROM, so called because it held one megabit and obviously because it was mega. Okay, so the mega ROM is pretty good and it does contain a lot of software that I use regularly, for example the disk filing system ROMs that uh, I have to load in with extra chips into the Model B. Um, and for any software that isn't in the mega ROM that I want to use, well, I could burn it to an EEPROM and fit it into one of the sockets inside on the motherboard, or I could load it onto one of these uh, plug-in cartridges and fit it into one of the slots behind the uh, keyboard, or I could load it in off the network or disk into one of the four sideways RAM banks inside the machine. Um, but much as I enjoy using the BBC Master, um, I don't really have a lot of inclination to do any word processing or spreadsheets on it anymore, however much I might hate Microsoft Office. But on the other hand, there is some software that I use regularly that isn't in the Mega ROM, for example, the network filing system. Um, so, although I could load that stuff in um, onto an EEPROM, I end up losing some of the sideways RAM banks. Um, if I put it on one of these cartridges, um, then uh, I have this thing sticking out the front um, behind the keyboard. So how about we take some of the software in that mega ROM that I don't use and replace it with some software that I do? Well, after about two and a half minutes of rambling introduction, that's exactly what we're going to be doing here today. The first problem is the chip itself. The mega ROM is, as the name suggests, a ROM, so it can't be rewritten, and it has a special pinout to make it physically smaller than a standard one megabit chip, so you can't just replace it with a standard off-the-shelf EEPROM either. Some people have made adapter boards for standard 128 kilobyte EEPROMs to fit in the Mega ROM socket, and the design is freely available online. But probably more flexibly, it's easy to replace it with one of the multi OS boards that use regular chips and can be bought complete online. There are two main models available one from IFEL and one from RetroClinic. Both come with a larger capacity chip and a switch to select between several banks of 128K, so you can effectively have a bunch of different Mega ROMs and choose between them for different setups. With the IFEL, you select between two banks using Jumper A9 on the internal board, and then between the three banks in each set using an external switch. The Retro Clinic has four chosen with an external knob. The chips they come supplied with are programmed with different MOS versions and sideways ROM setups for each selection. For example, they both come with a Master 3.20 setup, as well as the later 3.50, and the 1.20 from the Model B. The Retro Clinic also has 2.0 from the B+, and both contain Y2K fixes for the Master MOS versions. The IFEL lets you choose between SCSI or IDE hard disk drivers using the jumper, and the Retro Clinic supports one or the other, depending on which version you buy. IFEL also includes a special manager ROM for MOS 1.20 to insert or unplug sideways banks and select options on startup, much like the Master and the Integra B. This is battery backed, so I assume it's using spare space in the Master's CMOS. And finally, the IFEL one comes with an EEPROM, which is a bit more tedious to reprogram, requiring UV erasing, compared to the flash chip that comes with the Retro Clinic. Installation is pretty straightforward, you just remove the Acorn Mega ROM and install the multi OS board in the same socket. Here I'm putting in the Retro Clinic version. I've put an extra 28 pin spacer on the underside of the Mega ROM board to protect its pins. The bank selector switch can be wedged into the little notch near the power supply on the back, reserved for the internal modem cable, so you can change banks easily without having to open the case. 
Finally, you trail the switch cable across the inside of the case and connect it to the socket on the multi-OS board. With the RetroClinic version, you just have to be careful to steady it in the socket whilst you do this. Comparing the IFEL and RetroClinic boards, the IFEL one is much neater and doesn't overhang the socket for sideways ROM 6 and 7 compared to the RetroClinic board. This can be very important if you're installing something like a Go SDC, which I used to have in ROM 8 and had to get a bit creative with the spacers. Before we do any fiddling about to customise the ROM, let's check the multi-OS is working and see what we get with the RetroClinic board. We'll start by turning off the master and rotating the knob to the third position clockwise and then turn on. We get the default master MOS 3.20, which we can confirm with StarFX 0. We've also got the standard set of ROMs, but we have the clock fixed for Y2K. So we've essentially got the same system as the standard Mega ROM, but all ready for the 21st century. Power off and turn clockwise one notch to the fourth and final position, power on, and we've got MOS 3.50, the improved and final version for the master. We can tell it's 3.50 because ACORN is written in capitals, but we can confirm it with StarFX 0 again. Again, it's the same set of ROMs, but the slightly updated versions, which include things like star format for ADFS. Turn anti-clockwise all the way back to the first position and we get MOS 1.20 from the Model B. We get DFS, the disk filing system, view and some games added in ROM. Clockwise one stop to the second position and we've got MOS 2.0 from the B+. They added in the basic screen editor, DFS, View, Xmon and the advanced ROM manager and disk toolkits. The IFEL multi-OS setup for MOS 3.20 and 3.50 is largely the same as the RetroClinic version, save that Edit, the text editor, has been replaced by the master MOFS in the SCSI version. The MOS 1.2 version, however, is much more interesting. There's the basic toolkit, WordWise, the sideways RAM version of MMFS, and Xmon. But best of all, though, is the IFEL Manager ROM. This gives you a bunch of commands for setting a battery backed up configuration, similar to Star Configure on the master. These don't overlap with the master's normal settings and are useful for unplugging ROMs to free up RAM and lower page, or perhaps setting startup options. I don't think this ROM is available separately, so you can only get it with this switcher. Right, so let's get that flash chip out of the RetroClinic board to reprogram it. You'll need one of these special extractor tools for that, and remember to steady the board again whilst you do it. To work with the chip, I'm going to use a TL8662 Plus programmer, although it's now been superseded by the 3G version. It connects to a PC via USB and costs about £70 with a bunch of adapters for different types of chip packages. DIP package chips fit straight in, like this 16K27128 as used in the BBC Micro. It can program EEPROMs, EEPROMs, and flash chips. Note that it can't blank EEPROMs though, you'll still need a UV eraser similar to what I used in my EEPROM video for that. For the PLCC32 package RetroClinic chip, you'll need one of the adapters, which fits in the programmer, and then the chip goes in the top, taking care to line up the dot on the chip with the dot in the socket. We can now fire up the XG Pro software, which runs under Windows. First we select the chip type, the AM29F040B, with the PLCC32 package. We can then push read and a diagram pops up to confirm that we've got the right physical configuration in the programmer. When we then press read, the current contents of the chip are read into the buffer, which takes a few seconds, and when complete, they're displayed in this viewer in hex and ASCII. OK, I think we now need to stop and understand how the memory space in the Megarom is organised. The 128K in the Mega ROM starts with the 16K MOS operating system, followed by the 7 16K sideways banks in ascending order, from 9 to 15. So, in the RetroClinic MOS 1.20 set, we've got the MOS followed by the game ROMs, then the basic editor, view, DFS, and finally basic in bank 15. If we go over to XG Pro and look at the ROM contents, at the start we can see MOS 1.20, which is difficult to identify, but there's a BBC computer banner a little way in. Jumping to 4000 hex, we can see Rocket Raid in bank 9, and then Hopper at 8000 hex in bank 10. Skipping a few, DFS is in bank 14, down at 18,000 hex, and Basic is at the end, in bank 15, at 1C1000. To make the multi OS image, the different selections are then just stored as a series of mega ROMs, one after the other, in the order of the selector knob. 
MOS 1.20 is at the start, then 2.00 starts at 128k, 3.20 at 256k, and 3.50 is at the end, beginning at 384k, giving a total of 512k. So on the surface it looks easy. To get my custom Mega ROM I can just replace the corresponding 16k chunk of the multi-OS ROM with the software I want. And indeed for MOS 1.20 and 2.00 that is all you have to do. So back in XG Pro, before you go any further it's best to save out the starting contents of the multi-OS ROM to a file on disk just in case you mess anything up. I can save out one specific part of the multi-OS ROM to a file to keep separately, but it is a bit fiddly. For example, I want to save DFS from bank 14. I can use define block to specify the addresses from 18,000 hex to 1bfff inclusive, but just be careful of the tab order in those dialog boxes. The block save as function seems to store the data into a text file which you then can't load back in. Instead, the best way I've found is to copy it, change to a chip of the required size, e.g. a 27128 16k EEPROM, and then paste it in and save that. Going back to the original ROM, you can also just copy and paste within the buffer. For example, I want to move BASIC from bank 15 to bank 14. I can define the block. Then I can copy the contents, go to the bank 14 start address at 18,000 hex, and then choose paste. So once we've got all the ROMs we want lined up, we're ready to start. To load in a ROM, we just pick the file, Set the to address and be very careful to set clear buffer to disable, otherwise everything else in the buffer will be erased. We can then just repeat this process for each other new ROM that we want. After we're done, we can save out the new multi-OS ROM image. Then push the program button to update the contents of the flash chip. We can now remove the chip from the programmer with the special extraction tool and install it in the multi-OS board in the master, keeping the orientation dot on the left. And now the moment of truth. With the selector switch set to the first position, we power on. And the master starts up OK, which is a major relief as the operating system is in there. We can check the ROMs with star help and confirm what's in each bank with star ROMs, assuming we do have a ROM with that command available. ADFS seems to work as I can access my virtual hard disk. And MMFS is working as I can see a virtual floppy. Let's load up the text editor, which seems okay. So things are basically looking good. So that all works with MOS 1.20 and 2.00 because all the ROMs are separate and movable. When it came to the master, however, all the ROMs were packaged into the Mega ROM and the exact layout was fixed. Acorn made use of that to spread some extra code and data across the spare bits at the end of each bank and shoehorn in some extra features. This makes replacing some of the ROMs more tricky as you need to make sure you don't overwrite anything critical. Jonathan Harston has a good page explaining the details of this and the bits to avoid. For example in my ROM, replacing view sheet with ANFS is easy as there's nothing else in bank 10. The basic update is easy too as that's the same size and bank 12 isn't shared anyway. For bank 14 though, after view there's the high basic relocation table starting at 1BDA3. Fortunately the master version of MMFS doesn't use the entire 16k and we end up with just shy of 3k free. In XG Pro we can't load in part of a file, so instead we have to load in the ROM we want, and then select the portion we want, and then copy it to the clipboard. Then we load back in the multi-OS image, and adjusting the addresses for the fourth mega ROM by adding 60,000 hex, fill the block we want to arrays with zeros. Then we can paste in the bytes of the ROM image we want at the start of the bank, leaving a gap and the basic relocation table untouched. Once we've done all that, we can boot up into the MOS 3.50 bank and test it out. My extra ROMs are showing up with star help and star ROMs. MMFS is working with the page at E000, so we've got the master version. And I can use ANFS to log on to my Pi Acon Etbridge file server. And if we turn on the tube and push control break, we'll get the high basic that came with MOS 
This will test the relocation table is working fine as we don't get a crash and we've got 44k free. How about the IFEL board though? We could rewrite the EEPROM it comes with, but that's quite tedious as we have to keep sitting around waiting for the UV eraser every time we want to test a new version. If you swap the jumper cables from the selector switch around, though, you can, however, use the catchily named SST39SF040 flash chip, which holds 512K and gives you a choice of three sets of mega ROMs, as the first 128K can't be selected. I replaced the ROMs with a set same as my custom retro clinic setup, and swapped over the MOS 3.20 and 3.50 sets, so 3.50 is on the end switch position, as it's more convenient to select and I use it most of the time. So that's pretty much it, although the keen-eyed amongst you may have noticed some slightly odd version numbers in the sideways ROMs. This is because I'm using some updated builds. High Basic for MOSs 1.20, 2.00 and 3.50 have been updated to fix a bug in the log and trig calculations. And ADFS for MOS 1.20 and 2.00 has been tweaked with the different addresses for the master's hardware, as the standard 1.30 version for the Model B won't work. The source for all this is on Hoglet's GitHub site, save the Model B version of HiBasic, which you'll find on Stardot. Well, there you have it. You may be happy with your MOS 3.20 ROM, um, but a multi-OS does give you a few options. It gives you improved backwards compatibility with MOS 1.20, and if you run MOS 3.50, you get those uh, extra utilities for ADFS, as well as better support for high memory on a tube system. In terms of choosing between these two products, they're both very similar and excellent. Um, the Retro Clinic board, you could argue, is a little bit better in the sense it gives you four options and comes with a flash chip, so you don't have to buy anything else. Um, but on the other hand, the IFEL board is a lot neater. You can put a flash chip on it, and most importantly, it does come with that excellent um, manager ROM. Um, in terms of instructions, they both come with really detailed instructions explaining how they work, um, although the IFEL one does go the extra mile with lots of detail on how to customise the Mega ROM. So there you go. Um, thanks for watching, and I hope you found that interesting and maybe even useful, and see you next time.